Professor Bromberg. As we look back today at what has come to be called the Holocaust, we recognize that after 75 years, both the survivors and the perpetrators are for the most part no longer with us, and the few who remain are unlikely to be with us much longer. The opportunity for scholars and serious journalists to interview individuals who might have and might be willing to share experiences and knowledge of the events of the 1940s is disappearing. We are no longer in a good position to hear the voices of people with personal experiences and have to rely on whatever they said or wrote in the past, as long as that information is both accessible and, <coughs> excuse me, preserved. Two subjects to which I will turn in the latter part of this talk. The very substantial attention that's been accorded to the most recent trial in Germany of a functionary at Auschwitz is undoubtedly related to the fact that most of the last survi surviving perpetrators are escaping trial by passing on. But this is one who was actually brought into court but died before beginning to serve his jail sentence. There was considerable public attention to the subject of the horrors inflicted by Nazi Germany when some of the camps were liberated in 1945 and pictures appeared in newspapers and the then quite important newsreels, as well as what was mentioned in the broadcasts of some reporters. There was again some interest at the time of the main trial at Nuremberg when movie films on camps and related atrocities were shown. Although there was discussion and grief in the Jewish community and some men who had served in the American army and seen the horrors of the camps tried to make sure that the crimes were remembered thereafter. The scholarly community generally avoided the topic. When in 1951, after finishing my PhD, I became one of the original members of the War Documentation Project sponsored by the US Air Force. I developed a friendship with another original member of the group who was then still working on his PhD dissertation at Columbia University, Raul Hilberg. He was preparing a work on the systematic killing of Jews, what we now call the Holocaust. After he finished the dissertation, and revised it some for publication, he was for years unable to get it published as one publisher after another turned it down. A gracious person provided the subsidy that enabled a not very well-known Chicago publisher, Quadrangle Books, to issue it in 1961. This book entitled The Destruction of the European Jews may be said to have played an important part in opening the gates to serious work on the subject. And it is thus not surprising that it is now in its third and three volume edition published by Yale University Press. Like Hilberg in the 1950s, most of those who in the 1960s looked into the subject seriously utilized for their research the documents collected by the prosecution and the defense for the post-war trials at Nuremberg. This was a historically unique form of opening of some, some government records within a few years of their creation. And the enormous assistance this has provided to scholars interested in the 1930s and 1940s cannot be overestimated. There were, in addition, the transcripts of the main trial at Nuremberg and of the subsequent proceedings. Though very valuable, these materials did, however, have one significant impact on early work on the Holocaust that affected the perspectives of both scholars and the public. 
In the documents and trial transcripts, one heard and read the words of German government officials, policemen, soldiers, and defendants in post-war trials, but the voices of surviving victims were generally absent. This began to change a little with the 1961 trial of Adolf Eichmann in which quite deliberately survivors were brought into the court as witnesses, but it has taken considerable time for the evidence from victims and bystanders to become integrated into the efforts to reconstruct and understand developments. For some time, there was a scholarly dispute between what were called intentionalists and functionalists. The former argued that the systematic killing of Jews was planned and ordered from the top, while the latter held that the process was one of steady radicalization pushed forward over time by those involved in the persecution, <clears throat> excuse me, as they engaged in ever more radical procedures culminating at some point in systematic mass killing. The careful attention to local detail and local initiatives that characterized the work of those who can be called and who often consider themselves functionalists has certainly contributed greatly to our ability to follow the technical developments of mass murder, the local variations that frequently occurred, and the extent to which individual police, military, and administrative personnel could and did exercise their own judgment about the procedures to be followed in practice. Whatever the prior developments and the making of local decisions as reconstituted by scholars, however, there can now no longer be any doubt about the very last possible date of a formal decision at the very top, even though some of those writing about the Holocaust still to prefer to ignore the relevant evidence and continue to advocate something of a functionalist interpretation. <clears throat> we know from the Romanian record that was determined to be accurate by a German official who checked it at the time, that when Adolf Hitler met Romanian dictator Marshal Ion Antonescu in Munich on June 12, 1941, the latter asked Hitler what was to be done about the Jews in the Soviet territory that their armies were about to invade. An important issue for Antonescu, since the area that would be seized initially was known to contain a very large Jewish population. Hitler told him that they were all to be killed, an instruction that the evidence indicates he had earlier orally given to Heinrich Himmler. We also now have a clear confirmation of the meeting before the invasion of the Soviet Union at which a high SS official told the commanders of the Einsatzgruppen, the murder commandos, that were to follow the German armies into the Soviet Union, that a major part of their assignment was to kill all Jews in the territory the German and other Axis armies were about to occupy. I'll come back to the source for this resolution of a subject that was once quite controversial because in testimony after the war, there were variations in the accounts of this meeting. All the evidence we now have leaves no doubt that the commanders of the battalions of the order police, units with members more than 10 times as numerous as the Einsatzgruppen, were similarly instructed before the invasion, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> of June 1941. Hitler's own telling, the Minister of War of Croatia, in late July 1941, that all Jews in Europe were to be killed, 
and he's telling the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem in November of the same year that all Jews in the Middle East and in the rest of the world were also to be killed are both recorded in the German dip diplomatic documents published decades ago, although these very clear and explicit records are still ignored all too often by scholars working in the field of Holocaust studies. A trend in the scholarship that has not moved as far or as widely as this speaker thinks is needed is that of the very close interrelationship of the war as a fight between Germany and those it attacked on the one hand and the Holocaust on the other. It is only quite recently that those writing books on the war other than myself include any reference to the Holocaust at all. And similarly, those who write on the Holocaust pay much too little, too little attention to the realities of the fighting. Let me illustrate this issue with some examples. The murder commandos in many cases killed men, not whole families, in the first weeks of the German invasion of the Soviet Union. This is occasionally adduced as evidence for a first step that would be followed by radicalization subsequently. What is missing here is any reference to the reality of the early fighting on the Eastern Front. The German assault surprised the Red Army that Stalin had held back as he disregarded all warnings from his own intelligence service and from the British and American governments. The German forces under these circumstances advanced very rapidly and the German army's chief of staff, General Franz Halder, was sure on July 3rd, 1941, that the campaign had succeeded and that the rapid advance of German forces showed that a quick total victory was certain. This meant as a practical matter that a murder commando that had to follow an advancing German military unit through some of the most densely Jewish settled part of Europe at the rate of about 30 miles a day was simply not in a position to do anything else. The members of the unit would shoot the local men and come back when the front slowed down to kill women and children. The unit's members did what they could in the circumstances of the moment and they had no need either of new orders or the personal supervision of Heinrich Himmler, who, as we know, repeatedly came in the summer of 1941 to watch the program of the new, to watch the progress of the new program and trust it to his men, just as he would subsequently visit Auschwitz in the summer of 1942 to observe the killing procedure being implemented there. Neither Hitler nor Antonescu cared whether Jews were killed by shooting, gas, or other means. That was indeed a subject left to local initiative and preference, as long as the desired goal of systematic killing was kept in mind and attained as quickly as possible. A most critical point about the fighting, namely that the Allies first contained and then ended the Holocaust, also rarely receives the attention it deserves. Please do not be offended if I suggest that if the Germans had won and obtained control of the 47 of the then 48 states of the United States that the Japanese were willing for them to have, there would surely have been in any American group, some who themselves or their parents or grandparents would have been killed because they're Jewish. Some in this audience would have been killed as Jews, some non-Jews because of some handicap, and some would have contracted polio and either died as a result or have been crippled and then killed 
because the two doctors, Jonah Salt and Albert Sabin, whose discoveries conquered that disease in the 1950s, would both have been killed because they were Jewish. On the other side of the interrelationship between the course of the fighting and the Holocaust, those who have written endlessly about Erwin Rommel and his campaign in North Africa generally ignore a key part of his assignment. He was indeed originally sent there in April 1941 to salvage Italy's colony of Libya, lest the Italian people dump Mussolini when that colony was lost to British forces the way Italy's colonies in Northeast Africa had been lost in the preceding months, a point that was a major worry of Hitler. But why push the Africa Corps, as it was called, on into Egypt and the Middle East in 1942, and do this at a time when the primary military theater for Germany was the Eastern Front, where things were very obviously not going the way Hitler and his generals had confidently anticipated. The Germans from the summer of 1941 on closed the Suez Canal to shipping by mining it, and they intended for Italy to have Egypt and the Middle East for its oil, while Germany would get its oil from the Caucasus. In spite of these realities and plans, and in spite of the necessity for a renewed major summer offensive against the Soviet Union, the moment in the summer of 1942, it looked as if Ramos Africa Corps might get to Cairo and beyond. A special murder commando was attached to it. <coughs> this was not done because Himmler wanted its members to get a good tan or Hitler expected them to dismantle one of the pyramids so that it could be erected next to the Pergamum altar in Berlin. The whole point was that all Jews in the Middle East, about one million at the time, were to be killed before the area was turned over to Italy <coughs> because Hitler and Himmler, for good reasons of prior experience, did not trust the Italians to do so but did trust Rommel to direct the murder commander to do what Hitler had personally promised the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem a little more than half a year earlier. The area could only be turned over to the Italians after an experienced murder commander under Rommel's supervision had accomplished its mission. On one highly significant relationship, between the conduct of military operations and the Holocaust, there is the recently published book of Yaron Pasha that illustrates the way in which the German regime's, German regime's policy and priority of killing Jews at times directly impeded its own military operations. Just as much of the literature on the Holocaust ignores the interrelation of military operations with it, so too much of the literature on the fighting of World War II ignores the purpose for which Germany initiated the conflict, a worldwide demographic revolution in which the Germans and supposedly racially related people would alone inhabit the globe that had in the interim been totally cleansed of Jews. There is a further aspect of the second example I cited that is of major significance, but has also generally been ignored in the literature on both the war and the Holocaust. In the crisis of the summer of 1942, as it looked as if the Germans might conquer much of the Middle East from the North or from the West, the Red Army, greatly by American aid, shipped to and then across Iran, held the German thrust into and through the Caucasus Mountains. At the same time, the British 
also greatly by radical military measures personally ordered by President Roosevelt held the Germans in North Africa. If it had not been for these actions of the three major allies, the Germans would have killed all Jews in the Palestine Mandate. And after an Allied victory in the war, in spite of the temporary loss of much of the Middle East, no one would have considered establishing a Jewish state in, in an area where there was not a single Jew. The state of Israel is one result of the success of the Allies in halting German advances in the Caucasus and North Africa in the summer of 1942. But readers are unlikely to find any reference to this in the existing literature on either the war or the Holocaust. In connection with this development of the summer of 1942, there has also generally been another omission from the literature on the fighting of the war and on the Holocaust. The island of Madagascar is frequently mentioned in connection with the concept of sending Europe's Jews there, a concept raised in some quarters before the war and examined by German officials in the first years of the war but a project no one ever tried to implement. The real events that occurred in about and about Madagascar are actually of very great significance, are however usually not reviewed in their literature of recent decades. In the spring of 1942, after the Japanese had conquered Malaya and Burma, they sent a large portion of their navy into the Indian Ocean. The Germans urged and the Vichy government was prepared to accept a Japanese occupation of Madagascar. Such a move would certainly interfere dramatically with British and American supplies and reinforcements to the Middle East and to the Soviet Union around the Cape of Good Hope and via Iran in part at the insistence of Prime Minister Jan Christian Smuts of the Union of South Africa, and with assistance from the United States, the British landed a force on the northern tip of Madagascar in May 1942, seized a base there, and in a campaign of four months, conquered the whole Vichy-controlled island. If this had not happened, <clears throat> and instead the Japanese had taken control of the island, the Allied success in halting German advances and preventing a possible meeting of German and Japanese forces in the Middle East would have been most unlikely. How frequently has anyone interested in the war or the Holocaust been informed about these events concerning Madagascar in World War II. In recent decades, there has been, on the other hand, significant positive developments in the study of the Holocaust as a result of several trends. <clears throat> An especially important trend has been the declassification of very important relevant records. The agreement of the British government in 1996 to the opening of their interception and decoding of the reports of the German order police has transformed our understanding of the early stage of the Holocaust in 1941. It is now clear that these police battalions not only included about 10 times as many men as the murder commandos, the Einsatzgruppen, over 25,000 as compared with close to 3,000, but also undoubtedly killed far more Jews than the commandos, whose reports, because of their far earlier availability for research, had been a central piece of evidence in all prior statues 
of the subject and of course remain of great importance. The recent publication by the German city of Bremen on the participation in the Holocaust of two police battalions from that city, both supplements what we already knew about such units and also provides vivid details about their participation in such specific operations as the notorious September 1941 mass murder of over 30,000 Jews in the Ukraine at Babi Yar near Kiev, as well as the guarding of transports of Jews from Westerbork transit camp in the, in the Netherlands to Auschwitz beginning in the summer of 1942. Perhaps other German cities will follow the example of Bremen and facilitate first the research on and then the publication of the activities of the police battalions that originated in them. As for the real number of those who participated in the killing process, we need to remember the special units attached directly to Himmler's headquarters, some 10,000 men who, when added to the Einsatzgruppen and order police, make for a total of over 40,000 men, surely an adequate number for the killing of millions. Additional important information has come to light with the declassifications that came out of the 1998 <coughs> Nazi War Crimes Disclosure and Imperial Records Act passed by the American Congress. A major feature of that law was that it lifted the automatic exclusion from declassification review and from the implementation of freedom of information requests of two categories of American records, those relating to intelligence sources and methods and those called foreign government information, a general name utilized by the American government for material provided to the United States by a foreign government that had a security classification at the time it was given to our government. While records in the former category could now be and were subjected to systematic declassification review, in the latter case, the government had, that had provided the material and for World War II, this generally meant Great Britain, would be asked for its consent to declassification. The procedure in the former category relatively promptly led to massive declassifications and work on these newly opened materials is only now beginning. In the process of requesting permission to declassify in the latter category, it turned out that the British were unusually cooperative. As chair of the historical advisory panel, advising the interagency working group that had been established to implement the new law, I was told by several of those in the, at the working end of the declassification process, that this rather dramatic break with all their prior experience in dealing with the British on the declassification of records was most likely due to the widely known personal interest of then President Clinton in the general topic. If there were a holdup reported to him, he might telephone his friend, British Prime Minister Tony Blair at 10 Downing Street. And those in the relevant offices in and near London did not want a rocket from 10 Downing Street. Since by definition, the records in question were at least half a century old, the highly unusual rapidity of agreement to declassify was unlikely to cause any real problems for British security. <clears throat> An important byproduct of the declassification of American intelligence records 
was the publication of books by Richmond, Richard Brightman and others about the post-war American recruitment of Nazis, some with exceedingly dubious records by American intelligence agencies. One significant product of the declassification of foreign government information with the consent of the British government is the collection of summaries of British interrogations of mur murder commando Otto Ohlendorf in the summer of 1945, before he was turned over to the Americans in December of that year, <coughs> and which Hillary Earl could therefore utilize for her book on the Nuremberg trial of the murder commando leaders. It is reasonable to expect that in coming years, other researchers will find important information in the material that the British allowed the American government to open up. Obviously, the American government could ask for declassification of only those British documents of which copies had been given to it at the time. That left open the question of British records, especially of their intelligence services, of which no copies were to be found in American archives. That process also has been moving forward slowly but steadily in recent years. And scholars like Stephen Tyus have been making good use of these newly open records. We can expect important publications based on these declassified records in the coming years. While much of the records declassified in the last 40 years remains to be explored and exploited by scholars, there is a trend in the scholarship of the recent past that can only be welcomed. A number of researchers have looked closely at the individuals and the bureaucracy of murder at all levels and have produced fine studies that enable us to obtain a realistic picture of those who made the Holocaust work in practice. Christian Ingrao's belief in destroy intellectuals in the SS war machine published in France in 19, 2010 and appearing in an English language edition in 2013 may serve as a fine example. Other studies which have brought us insight into the individuals whose eager participation was essentially to the killing process have been prepared by Michael Veld and edited by Klaus Michael Meitmann and Gerhard Paul. The book on the German military participation in systematic murder in Belarus by Waitman Beyond is especially revealing on the way the killing of Jews became something of a standard procedure for ordinary German soldiers on the Eastern Front. On the other side of the process, is the clearer view we can obtain about the victims from such works as Christopher Browning's 2010 book, Remembering Survival Inside a Nazi Slave Labor Camp. A fundamental work on the whole issue of the Holocaust history is Henry Friedlander's The Origins of Nazi Genocide, From Euthanasia to the Final Solution while an approach to a key aspect of the reality of that terrible time can be seen in the account of Father Patrick de Bois, The Holocaust by Bullets, a priest's journey to uncover the truth behind the murder of one and a half million Jews. Some may be surprised by omission, by my omission of the arguments of the issues surrounding the Jewish councils established by the Germans and subsequently often killed with the members of the Jewish communities from which they'd been recruited. 
please forgive me if I stress the point that the members of these councils did not know what nobody else on earth knew, how and when the war would end and what would be the situation of their communities when that happened. There is now also a clearer perspective on two quite different facets of the events. <clears throat> a way in which some tried to profit from the murder of their former neighbors is illustrated quite dramatically by the 2012 book of Jan Gross, Golden Harvest, Events at the Periphery of the Holocaust which offers insight into the digging up of a, both the dead and the related materials by, for profit by substantial numbers of diggers. On the other side, the way a few Jews try to protect themselves and their families by aiding the Nazis is described by Peter Wyden's 1992 book, Stella which recounts the activities of a notorious Jewish woman who assisted the Nazis in catching Jews trying to survive with false identities or in hiding in wartime Berlin. <coughs> if the descendants of the woman who betrayed Jews to the Nazis have problems, problems engaging their situation with this ancestry, it is worth to considering those of Jennifer Teague. The woman, <clears throat> as an adult, <clears throat> makes the discovery that her mother was the daughter of the murderer Amon Guth, who is shown shooting Jews as a form of morning entertainment in the famous movie Schindler's List. She not unreasonably entitled her memoirs my grandfather would have shot me. She now does some speaking for the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum about her experiences and findings. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> While referring to recent literature in the field, I should also comment on our vastly improved understanding of the concentration camp system as a result of specialized work on that subject. We now have Niklaus Wachmann's KL, A History of Nazi Concentration Camp, the book of Timothy Ryback on the earliest killings at Dachau concentration camp, and Sarah Helms' carefully researched and detailed study of Ravensburg, Life and Death in Hitler's Concentration Camp for Women. In general, what we are increasingly seeing is the publication of books by scholars and journalists, excuse me, <clears throat> who have utilized whatever is now available to uh, create accounts of portions and aspects of the Holocaust that can be far closer to definitive than was possible in the early, earlier years of scholarly attention to the subject. Furthermore, there are now journals devoted to the subject, like Holocaust and Genocide Studies, which is sponsored by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and which regularly contains peer-reviewed articles and book reviews in the field. <clears throat> there is the important series, Lessons and Legacies, published by Northwestern University Press on behalf of the Holocaust Educational Foundation of Skokie, Illinois, which has also begun to publish a helpful annual bibliography of Holocaust studies. There is also the important series entitled Yad Vashem Studies, published by the Yad Vashem Institute in Jerusalem. Clearly, I go could go on and mention a substantial number of additional authors in their books, 
But the point that ought to be clear is that the field obviously attracts serious scholars in many countries. This generally generalization certainly applies to Israel, the United States and Germany, as well as other European countries. Since German universities make it a practice to produce fine scholars, but to hire only minute numbers to teach enormous so-called seminars, many of the German scholars have to do their teaching in other countries, like Peter Longrich, who teaches in England, and Christian Gerloff, who teaches in Switzerland, and who have both published very important works in the field and are quite likely to produce even more. Another major development of the recent past is the establishment of centers for the study of the Holocaust in this country, in Washington, D.C., and, <coughs> <excuse me, coughs> and a substantial number of other American cities at several universities and in other countries as well. These not only produce significant scholarly work and support research and publication in the field, but they also contribute in an important way to the knowledge and understanding of the Holocaust by a wider public. The exhibits offered by some of these institutions, most obviously Yad Vashem and the one in Washington, attract very large numbers of visitors and classes of school children and other special groups of adults. This trend interacts <clears throat> with the push in several American states for the inclusion of some information about the Holocaust in public school curriculum. It is in regard to this latter suggestion that the passage of 75 years has significant implications. For the current generation of students and youngsters, both the fighting of World War II and the Holocaust are essentially as remote as the events of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. If the dangers and implications of the events we currently discuss are to become a part of the memory inherent of current and future generations, this aspect of the issue is certain to increase in importance in the future. <clears throat> May I suggest that a significant issue all need to confront and engage is this divergence between the clearer and more thoroughly based published scholarship about the Holocaust on the one hand and the general mental distance from it and the war of which it was an essential part on the other. It is in this regard that the passage of 75 years and the likely continuation of both trends place a special burden on those of us who work in this field. We not only have the responsibility of informing ourselves about the events of those years and where and when that is possible to add to the existing body of knowledge by careful research and publication, but we also need to find, try to find ways to remind our society of the enormous dangers to the human condition that once led to the deaths of millions and that can recur if people do not exercise great care. We may know in broad outline and often in some detail how a society can go horrendously wrong in spite of prior fine traditions and a high level of education. The reality that the events of the Holocaust <clears throat> recede into an ever more distant past in no way eliminates the possibility that other societies on any continent 
could potentially move in a similar direction. The Germans who initiated and implemented the Holocaust did not belong to some separate species of beings on earth. Who can predict with any confidence which society on which continent might react to the future impact of climate change, for example, by some horrendous policy toward neighbors believed or assumed to be either responsible for the deprivation or having profited from the dramatic change that is affecting them. Another significant development in the field of Holocaust studies has been its inclusion with other genocides in centers, programs, and courses. This is a development that should not, in this speaker's opinion, be opposed. It is essential, however, that in the process, there not be any gliding over of distinctive features of the Holocaust that have not been a part of any other of the horrors that we call genocide. I am not suggesting that the Holocaust is worth worse than other genocides, but there are significant differences between it and the other genocides that the courses and programs engage. The most obvious of these fundamental differences, I would suggest, is the geographic one. <clears throat> All other genocides had a specific geographic focus. Those who killed others <clears throat> invariably did so to remove a hated population element from a specific area. The Armenian genocide was a terrible event in the Ottoman Empire. Those who ordered and those who perpetrated it were not interested in Americans, Armenians who had settled in the United States, Latin America, or anywhere else outside the Ottoman Empire. The Ustasha, who were busy murdering Eastern Orthodox Christians in the World War II puppet state of Croatia, were not planning to kill Eastern Orthodox Christians who had moved to Chicago or lived anywhere else in Europe. The Holocaust was a project to kill all Jews on the globe, regardless of location. The Allies were successful in containing it and thereby saving approximately two thirds of the intended victims. But that was certainly a great disappointment to those who initiated and implemented that particular genocide. <clears throat> Another difference between the Holocaust and other genocide is the routinized preparation of it and in routinized implementation by vast numbers of, fish, of officials, soldiers, and others over a period of four years before they were halted. There were other differences, but the two I've mentioned should make the point. This development in Holocaust studies makes even more important than the special professional concern of historians and other scholars, the major issues of access to records on the one hand and the preservation of records on the other. The American records relating to the Holocaust <clears throat> have been systematically declassified. <clears throat> this does not preclude the possibility that some items that were misfiled or not recognized as related to the subject can turn up in the future. But that is and will always be a possibility in the masses of modern records. The relevant German records in Germany and any still held in the United States 
written in French, are also, as far as we know, accessible or in the process of being open. The Germans have been working hard to obtain permission to microfilm German records that were captured by the advancing Red Army and are scattered in archives all over the Russian Federation in exchange for giving the Russian a set of the films. To the extent to which these provide additional information on the Holocaust is largely unknown at this time, but suggests an important collection of materials to be utilized in future investigations. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, Brit the British have been declassifying their holdings of intelligent files from World War II, and it's reasonable to assume that before long, that process will be completed. In other European countries, the process differs some from state to state, and a complete survey of that issue remains to be prepared and published. That's a suggestion for a doctoral dissertation topic offered at no charge. This situation leaves for consideration the two major types of relevant records of the existence of which we know, we know, but that are not as yet fully accessible to scholars. These are the files of the presidential archives of the Soviet Union and the World War II intelligence files of the Soviet Union, both held and kept closed by the current regime in Moscow. The presidential archive is of course especially important for a wide array of issues of Soviet foreign and domestic policy. <clears throat> Still closed portions of it may well contain some references to information on the Holocaust that was provided to Stalin during the war. <coughs> Almost certainly much more important for our topic are the Soviet World War II intelligence records. In addition to whatever they may contain about Soviet intelligence reports on the situation in the parts of the Soviet Union occupied by the Germans and their allies, and also elsewhere in Europe, there is the quite probably even more issue of decoded intercepts of German radio messages. The Soviet intercept stations were far closer geographically to German military and administrative offices sending messages from Poland and the occupied Soviet Union than the British Y stations in England, North Africa, the Middle East, and eventually <clears throat> southern parts of Europe. They may therefore include individual or whole sets of messages not intercepted by the British and either already declassified or in the process of declassification currently. <clears throat> Just as the declassification of British intelligence records has opened up and continues to open a whole set of new perspectives on some aspects of the Holocaust. <clears throat> so any substantial opening of Soviet intelligence records is very likely to provide new insights as well as further significant details. As no one needs to be remembered, the Soviet Union dissolved over two decades ago. At first, there was thereafter a very substantial opening of access to records. But over the years, there has been in the Russian Federation something of a reversal, ironically, precisely in the years in which in other countries, there has been an increasing willingness to open records up. 
Certainly there has been more access both to Russian scholars and those from other countries than was true in the former Soviet Union. But the reality remains that the situations ha situation has been for some years and is currently behind that of all other major World War II allies. <clears throat> As I will point out in the next portion of this talk, the current restrictive policy is extremely likely to keep even those who insist on locking, locking up parts of the records from ever being able to benefit from reading it themselves. The issue of access is very closely related to the issue of preservation. In World War II, all belligerents deliberately utilized poor paper in order to use their resources for an more important things than such current issues as reports on the situation, orders for immediate action, and requisitions for paper clips. That paper is in the process of disintegrating, and some of it is already no longer readable. If it is not microfilm, it will be permanently inaccessible to its guardians as well as interested scholars. This is an aspect, <coughs> excuse me, of the still closed records that has not received the attention that both in my judgment and my experience in researching World War II records, it, it, the attention it deserves and desperately needs, it simply doesn't have. I remember urging the head of the German Federal Archive in Koblenz in 1942 to microfilm any and all records that had not been microfilmed when in Britain or the United States. He was clearly so certain that now that the records were back in clean German hands from the messy custody of the Allies, the paper would last forever. Well, he was so certain he dismissed my advice as superfluous. Fortunately, his successor realized that World War II paper was deteriorating regardless of who had custody of it, and he inaugurated a large project to film the records of the Chancellery, the Reichskanzlei, for example. There were no doubt some agencies that had good paper left over from earlier times or choices. But these would not necessarily be the most important ones. In a file of the German army group defending Berlin in the last weeks of the war, I noticed when we were microfilming those records in the 1950s, that there is among the already then barely legible sheets of deteriorating paper, one piece of correspondence on elegant, well-preserved paper. It carries the carefully printed letterhand of der Bevollmächtigte des Reichsführers SS für das gesamte Diensthunde und Taubenwesen, the plenipotentiary of the Reichsführer SS for all military dog and pigeon matters. The records of that office, if they still exist somewhere, will be found to be on fine paper, but they are unlikely to be of great significance for an understanding of either the war or the Holocaust. Closely related to the issue of deteriorating paper, though rarely mentioned in connection with it, is the issue of inaccessible electronic records. No one wants to hear this, but the reality is, and is practically certain to remain, that records in electronic format remain accessible even fewer years than those in the deteriorating paper I just mentioned. 
Those who do not want to believe what I am about to say are welcome to their view. But if that's your opinion, please remember to any office, library, or archive that you visit or work in hereafter the following questions. How many machines do you have that can read a five inch floppy disk? Technology changes and is certain to continue to do so. Electronic records, even if they don't deteriorate and are transmutable to subsequent forms of electronic records are certain to be inaccessible in a decade or two. In a gov American government advisory committee in the late 1990s, the members were informed that the government could no longer access very substantial portions of its own records of the Vietnam War. This is certain to be a continuing problem as people refuse to engage the reality of ideological technological change. Digitization is fine as long as all involved recognize that this is a format that facilitates access from widely scattered and distant locations, but only for a short time, most likely a decade or at most two decades. <clears throat> Microfilm will last 75 to 90 years before it needs to be mechanically duplicated, a well-established process that has to be repeated at subsequent equal intervals. Such processes as HD Rosetta, in which miniaturized letters are engraved onto a small metal plates, will produce an item that will last for centuries, can be employed to create several copies simultaneously, and turns out a product which can always be read because the one thing we'll always be able to do is to magnify as we read. But to the best of my knowledge, practically no one is currently pushing in this direction. The United States Holocaust Memorial Museum is currently raising funds for a permanent home for its holdings of documents, testimonies, and pictures. One can only wish them well in this effort, but realistically, we have to recognize that much of the records scattered in numerous archives, libraries, and other institutions will simply not be accessible to future scholars and the public because it has not been preserved in an accessible, physical or electronically accessible form. Moving records into the clouds may well turn out to be the most effective and secure way to assure permanent preservation of records, whatever their current format. But this procedure is in its beginning stage. This somewhat sad note brings me to a very different question. In what directions might the study and research on the Holocaust move in the coming years. <clears throat> there will surely be further studies of the Holocaust in specific portions of German-controlled Europe, the reach into the Dardanelles Islands in Asia, the plans for an ever wider reach of the final solution, and of the roles of perpetrators at different levels, as well as the participation of local collaborators in German-occupied and allied lands. We may also see further studies of the post-war fates of both survivors and perpetrators. In regard to the former, there will quite likely be some further attention to the DP, the displaced persons camps, and those who left them to resettle in countries all over the globe. In regard to the latter, we made further studies of the type 
published recently by David Messenger and Katrin Perla. We can also expect to see some further exploration of the extent to which allied governments found out about the Holocaust, at what time, in what detail, and with what impact, if any. A point about the records of intelligence agency, and especially their collection of decoded German messages, is an aspect of the documentary situation that has often been overlooked in the 75 years since the end of the Holocaust. As the Allies advanced in the later years of the war, they both drew nearer to the German stations sending radio messages, so there were fewer gobbles and missed messages, and also their ability to decipher intercepted messages improved. Furthermore, one byproduct of the Allied bombing campaign was that it obliged the Germans to resort increasingly to the use of radio, subject to interception, instead of teletype mail or messengers. At the same time, more and more paper German records were either deliberately destroyed by the Germans and were lost to fighting and bombing. The reality is that as the surviving German records record gets slimmer, the allied records grew more complete and thicker. In this regard, my pre previous comments on the preservation issue are especially relevant. This issue of preservation must also be seen in connection with the trials of war criminals in the post-war era. The mimeograph paper of those years will not be readable much longer, and some of it is not readable now. The U.S. National Archives has done a considerable amount of microfilming in the records of the subsequent proceedings at Nuremberg, but the transcripts and documents of numerous trials still await a filming program. There were many trials in the Soviet zone of Germany, and those records also are on deteriorating paper. The denazification proceedings raise the same issue of preservation, and so do the records of the office established by the German government in Ludwigsburg to investigate those who might be charged in trials for their offenses during the war. And this agency holds very extensive records on its investigations and the materials collected for them. This problem of preservation, of course, applies also to the records of war crimes trials held by such countries as Poland, France, Italy, and others. What those who want to work in the field are certain to face is that with the passage of additional years, the physical record of preservation of records will increasingly dominate the problem of accessibility of records that have been so important in the past. Nobody wants to hear this, but the great risk is that in the future, those wishing to do research on the Holocaust could find themselves in the situation that historians of the ancient world face all the time, reliance on surviving monuments, tombstones, coins, and fragments of works on decent rag-based paper with reproduced microfilms records put into the clouds and engraved metal plates as their only modern supplement. If what I have just said is not bad enough, I should add that the paper of many books and journals dealing with a Holocaust subject is also in the process of chemical self-destruction. These are not pleasant prospects, but the passage of 75 years will soon place us in a situation where there are few alternatives for those who are interested in a very extraordinary and important aspect of world history 
in the 20th century. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Weinberg, for this really thought-provoking and wonderful lecture. In your opening frame, you invited us to consider the fact that the opportunity to speak and ask questions to those with experience and knowledge of the 1940s is rapidly disappearing, but we have such an opportunity today, and I know we have many, many questions. So we're gonna start right now with the questions, and here's the first one. I will read it. We're gonna put all the questions on the screen, and Professor Weinberg will answer. Do you believe your experiences growing up in Nazi Germany are the reason for your choice to become a historian, a teacher? The answer is <clears throat> that the experience has had rather different impact on me. In school, in this boarding school in England, I was so impressed by the teachers there that at the ripe age of 11, I decided that's what I'm going to do someday. And when in this country, I was in junior high school and then high school, I tentatively concluded that the teaching area I wanted to do was social studies and Latin. I therefore attended what was then New York State College for Teachers in Albany, where I was living, what is now the State University at Albany. But that was interrupted by service in the U.S. Army, and that meant that the GI Bill would make it possible for me to do some work towards a doctoral degree, and I decided to pick history out of the social studies as the field, and you know, it, the experiences that I had had <clears throat> suggested that diplomatic and military history should be the area of concentration. Okay, let's take another question. We'll wait a moment for the question. In your paper, Kristallnacht 1938, you mentioned that the burning of your local synagogue was the act that most drastically changed you at the time. Why do you believe that this incident was the most influential moment for you? How important were religious observances and the sense of belonging to the Jewish community during your childhood and later in forming your identity? In the German word for what we call a house of worship of any faith, it's called in German Ein Gotteshaus, a house of God. At the time in November of 1938, I'm a couple of months short of my 11th birthday, I knew that people could be nasty to each other students, others would beat me up. There was lots of talk about the First World War in which my father had been wounded. In downtown Hanover, one would see signs on the uh, restaurants that they would not serve Jews, that people would be unpleasant to, and do nasty things to other people. I thought was bad, but was a part of life. But that people would be so mad at God that they would burn down God's house. That, to me at the time, was in a fundamentally different category from the uh, persecution of Jews and other very bad things. And of course, the uh, synagogue, the house of worship in Hanover 
to which we had periodically gone was across the street from a building which previously had been the synagogue and there was now a school there and after I was kicked out of the regular school I had been attending I was for a few weeks in this school and that meant that every day I passed and walked by the ruins of the synagogue that we attended, if you will. <clears throat> so there was something fundamentally different in this event from other bad events of which there were plenty going on plenty had taken place before and i think that that is what made it not easier to understand but at least easier to study the events uh, in the reality of the time rather than uh, without some appreciation for the <clears throat> extent to which the horror could go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we have another question? Some years ago, this question is from Joseph Shire. You gave a lecture in Toronto on Pius the Twelfth, in which you reviewed Pius's reaction to what you called Nazi murder campaigns, beginning with the murders in Poland in autumn 1939, murders that included Polish Catholic leaders at a time when Italy was not in the war and when the Soviet Union was Germany's ally. With the opening of the Vatican records, are you aware of any discoveries in these archives that should change the perception, not only of Pius, but of the church? Not many years before World War II was the Spanish Civil War, uh, when senior Catholics spoke of the Masons, Socialists, and Jews as the enemies of all. Why would anyone be surprised by the Vatican's attitude in the years so soon after? Who would you suggest to review these documents? Your talk today referred to Germany's collaborators, so why no mention of the Vatican and its intelligence sources during the war, and the preservation of its records. Uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. There has just literally in the, the recent days been a new development in this field. And uh, it is a development which we can only welcome. But what we really need to understand is that until now, the relevant Vatican records were closed. And that uh, we knew from, we knew two things. And that is that the Vatican was informed by bishops in areas under German control of the horrors that were going on but that Pius XII had little or nothing to say about this and was on the whole more inclined to favor the German than the Allied side in the war as a whole. He had spent many years in Germany and as the Secretary of State, Foreign Minister of the Vatican, had been the key person in negotiating the Concordat, the treaty between the Vatican and Nazi Germany in 1933. He therefore followed the Nazi violations of the Concordat in the 1930s, but ne never as to the extent that his predecessor, Pius XI, did. And unlike 
Pius XI had nothing to say in public about matters. Now we can expect to see something else in the coming years, but uh, the records hopefully are physically preserved so that scholars now have access where they did not in the past. Thank you. Let's take the next question. Speaking of matters historians never touch on related to World War II, until almost the end of the war, Sweden supplied Germany with high-grade iron ore. This might have prolonged the war by a year because low-grade ore takes much more steel to get it to the level needed for the high-grade steel needed for weapons. Why did the Allies not interdict this trade? They could have bombed the ships from the air or the sea since they were coming from northern, mm, I can't read that one word is covered up by, but to Norway. It's a very good question, but I would suggest that the answer lies in their concern that the moment that they did something about this, the Germans would occupy Sweden as they had earlier occupied Norway as soon as the British began to leave mines uh, to stop the iron ore being shipped in the winter when the Baltic Sea was frozen up from the Norwegian port of Narvik. The Germans had therefore solved, from their point of view, solved this problem militarily by occupying Narvik and all of Norway. The process had important negative military implications for Germany also because they lost a lot of their navy in the process, but they could get the iron ore. If we had, you know, the British or the Russians had in, tried to interfere with the Swedish uh, key uh, element in the German war industri industrial war economy, the Germans would unquestionably have occupied Sweden. They had plans for this in any case. And of course, in a post-war world, if Germany won, Sweden, like Norway and Finland and Denmark, were all going to be annexed to Germany. But uh, this simply under the circumstances where the Germans are now in control of Norway, allied with Finland, were likely to occupy Sweden rather quickly. Uh, it just did not seem appropriate. Let's have another question. Thank you. Did the extermination squads which formed part of Rommel's forces ever become operational before the British drove them back? The extermination squad attached <clears throat> to Rommel's headquarters in the summer of 1942, a large part of it remained in Greece because only the top officers were sent to Rommel's headquarters. And then as Rommel was halted at Alamein and in October of 42, uh, the British uh, with American aid drove him uh, out of uh, the peace of Egypt and all of Libya. The murder squad membership didn't get sent to North Africa. The German plan uh, was halted uh, at Alamein with American aid and therefore uh, Nothing much happened there. That did not <clears throat> help Jews in Tunisia when in the winter of 42-43 uh, there was fighting there with the, after the Americans and Brits landed in French Northwest Africa 
in November of 42 and planned then to meet the British forces coming back uh, from crushing Rommel at Alamein. The Germans occupied uh, Tunisia and uh, there were some Jews literally uh, eat, not just restricted there and persecuted there, but flown back uh, to be killed uh, in planes that had brought ammunition and other things to the German troops there. But uh, the killing commando that was to go with Rommel into the Middle East never got the opportunity to do so. Thank you. Let's take the next question. Your Kristallnacht article discussed the concept of killing being a nine to five, six days a week job with a lunch break. To what extent was killing seen as a regular job by those involved at that time? This question is not meant to discount the horror, but I wonder what the perception of a perpetrator was during this time. Was it seen as a normal thing to do? I think that both the nastiest but also most helpful example that will serve as an answer to this question it can be seen in the killing of the handicapped. That was in that program that Hitler started two years before starting the killing of the Jews, that Germans experimented there. How do you do all these things? How do you define those who are to be killed? How do you gather them? How do you kill them? How do you dispose of the bodies? And very important, how do you recruit and train those who will kill from the time they go to work to, except for a lunch break, they go home. In the summer of 1941, as there were more casualties on the Eastern Front and more noise at home about the killing of the handicapped, it was decentralized. Instead of the people being sent to killing centers, the killing centers were used for Jews instead, and everything was decentralized to hospitals. And from the fall of 1941 on until May of 1945, that was someone's job. Let me put this in concrete and specific terms. You have a hospital in a German city, whether it's in the north, in uh, Bremen or Kiel or what, or in the south, in Munich or Freiburg. In that hospital, one nurse is told, doctors will assign those patients who don't have much chance to a room number 302 and Wednesdays you go in and give a fatal injection to everybody who's in room 302. And the nurse says, no, I won't do that. Well, okay, nurse A, you won't, you get to clean the toilets on the second floor on Wednesday. But nurse B who's there says, yes, I will do that. Comes the end of the war. By this time, when nurse A got up in the morning to go to the hospital, she knew her job was to go to the second floor and clean the toilets. Nurse B knows on Wednesday, when she gets up, she goes to room 302 to see if there are any patients that the doctors have sent there from some other room. And if there's one there or if there are five there, 
she gives them a fatal injection. What is striking, and Henry Friedlander has made this clear, that when the war ends in the German surrender 75 years ago, that is stopped. But in a few of the hospitals, the procedure is still going on. And the occupying authorities have to physically go into the hospital and tell the people, you got to stop this, no more killing of the patients. And that ends the killing of the patients. In other words, for some of these individuals, the doctors have been sending the patients up there for three and a half years. And a nurse, or if she for some reason got transferred, some other than nurse has been going into that room for three and a half years and giving a fatal injection. Now, I mentioned in my talk a book by Waitman Bjorn called Marching into Darkness, in which he points out how in Belarus, White Russia, the German military directly involved in the killing of Jews there. And for the German soldiers involved, this becomes simply standard practice. And there are a couple of recent publications in Germany, which are histories of German divisions, army divisions. And what I find very striking is that we knew that these divisions, frontline divisions, were occasionally assigned to anti-partisan operations in the rear areas. And in these, the different regiments of the same division sometimes followed slightly different policies. They were told to kill everybody and some of the regiments did that. But another regiment of the same division in the same days, in the same area, in the same operation, they don't kill babies and tiny kids. And if one asks what's going on here, there's not some kind of coincidence of different soldiers, but rather the soldiers have gotten the word. And in regiment one, the word is kill everybody, the colonel in charge. And in regiment two, uh, the commander had said, uh, kill everybody except the babies and the tiny kids. And then the soldiers do that. Uh, one has to see this as an area where there are very few choices left. And what we also know is that if and when anybody refused, the answer certainly in the military invariably was, there are plenty of other things that have to be done. The German army of World War II depended overwhelmingly on horses over three million of them. And so uh, if Private X or Corporal Y or uh, Private First Class Z uh, was not, uh, or the police member A or B, there were, somebody got to clean up after the horses. Somebody's got to haul up ammunition. Somebody's got to do this. There are always a million other things that have to be done. And so the, the others start. And after a while of doing this, it becomes a routine. And I think one has to recognize that bad things people do become routine too. Good things people do also after a while become routine. If you want, I'll give you an example. 
when I arrived in the fourth replacement depot in Zama, Japan, I was assigned to depot supply and to emergency supply. And the first day, that, that meant taking stuff to the, bringing stuff into the depot or taking it out. On the first day, the warrant officer said to me, Private Weinberg, to do this or that, you will for this need four trucks and you will tell the, the, the meal sergeant how many trucks you have. Needless to say, I said, yes, sir. But then I asked the other uh, person in emergency department, what is the connection between my lunch and the number of trucks? And he said, oh, the fourth replacement depot only feeds American soldiers. But at lunchtime, we pass out food to the drivers and helpers because they've been very hungry in the war. And so you tell the mess sergeant, you will get appropriate and stop at noon and pass out the food. And needless to say, that is what I proceeded to do. And I would notice one or another of them might put the food into a pocket, obviously to take home to a member of the family. And I wouldn't say anything. But every day thereafter, if it was an all day trip, I knew I'd tell the mess sergeant four trucks, five trucks, three trucks, and the veterans of the Japanese army who were working for the Americans would get their lunch. Now, this was uh, the routine. And uh, that can do, can happen with bad things as well as good things. Thank you for that answer. Gerhard, are you good to go until 1215? Can you take a few more questions? Yeah, sure, I can take more questions. You have a lot of stamina. Okay, we're gonna go until 1215. Here's our question from Connor Sebastian, one of our PhD students. My favorite feature of your historical scholarship is the use of perfect examples and anecdotes to illustrate the broad arguments you are making. For example, tanks being delivered with desert camouflage to the Eastern Front in 1942, showing Hitler's original earmarking of this equipment for the Middle East, or giant battleship engines being produced and then immediately scrapped in 1944, reflecting Germany's earlier and later abandoned attempts to build a blue water navy to rival that of the United States. As you have worked through vast collections of archival documents on the big questions of World War II and the Holocaust, what methods have you used to find and organize all of these stories and small but illuminating details? One just asked, in my opinion, one that I did, and one has to be very, very careful in archival research. There's just simply no way that one can allow prior assumptions, uh, views, beliefs, or hopes uh, to affect one. And one therefore needs to look uh, at the issues and at the evidence and make an effort to understand the people who did whatever created the records. Because those people act not on your views, not on my views, they act on the basis of their views. And uh, what may <clears throat> at first sight look very peculiar or irrational, may be peculiar or irrational, 
but it can be understood only in the context of the actor's uh, beliefs, hopes, and views. And if one does that, then one is more likely to recognize what at first sight look weird things for uh, signs of what the individual about whom the records have been created had in mind at the time. Okay, thank you. Another question, a uh, very interesting question. Grudges can follow one around for one's whole lifetime. Did you ever feel that way toward those who wronged you during the Holocaust? If so, what allowed you, if you have, to move on from your resentment towards past enemies? Well, the answer to that is that I have never had, to the best of my knowledge, the uh, chance to meet anybody who personally affected me or members of the family. And so my own view has been that one deals and should deal with people on the basis of current experience. And so uh, I have had uh, the opportunity to lecture in Germany and to talk to people there and to uh, engage uh, other scholars. And uh, one needs, I would suggest, uh, to move on. That on the one hand, it is important, in my opinion, that individuals who have personal responsibility for horrors should, at the time when it was possible, have been arrested, tried, and punished in some appropriate way. But one should not generalize. And because somebody belongs to some country that did terrible things, that doesn't make that person terrible. And I have therefore uh, not had any, uh, felt any need uh, to uh, hold grudges against uh, Germans I have met in scholarly discourse when I have taught at Bonn for a semester, dealt with the students who obviously had nothing to do with any of those events, uh, and met uh, individuals who at some point uh, had been drafted in the last years of the war into the German army. It's just a past that is fortunately past. Thank you. We're going to take a few more questions. And here is a question from students. Do you see any similarities between your experience living under Nazi rule in Germany and your experience in lockdown conditions today? How do you feel about the terminologies of war? Words like front lines and unprecedented, which is a word you use to describe what happened during the winter of 38-39, being used in the context of the coronavirus. Do you find it disrespectful? It, it seems to me that there is a, a ridiculous aspect to this. We're not distinguishing between people who have uh, blonde hair or dark hair, uh, we are trying to preserve anybody of any race, any religion, any age, any color or whatnot. It is an effort of a society to protect itself, not against a foreigner, not against some other country, but against a disease. And 
under those circumstances, uh, I don't, I mean, I don't see this uh, as uh, like a war. Uh, I see it as a self-protective measure. Uh, it is on an extreme broad level, but that's because the threat is extreme and broad. And that would be the case with a major earthquake or a hurricane or a tornado. It's just that this is a very big one. <laughs> and therefore, uh, we all, not this group or that group, we all do what seems to make sense to cope with the circumstances. Thank you. We're going to take just a few more, and I think we have uh, a question coming right now. Uh oh, Hopefully. yep. Okay. Um, oh, good. This is interesting. Yeah. Why do you feel people should read Hitler's work, and why was it important to have the second book published? In your opinion, what can someone learn from reading Hitler's works? What were your aims and hopes in publishing Hitler's second book? And were these fulfilled? Uh, obviously, uh, Hitler was a very central figure in the history of the 20th century. <clears throat> we all knew that he wrote a book called Mein Kampf. There is a good English language translation of it available by Ralph Monheim. When in 1958, uh, I turned up what I called Hitler's second book, because it was the only other one he wrote. There was no title on the book itself, on the original typescript. It seemed to me that it was important for people to have access to this. And the only way they could have access is for it being first published in Germany, uh, as indeed it was. And then it took me several decades to get an American publisher, that one after another turned me down, uh, to publish a reliable English language edition. It would provide those who wanted to take the time to read it, as is true with Mein Kampf, which is of course a much fatter book than this one, to give some insight into a central figure in world history, uh, determining the patterns of the world in which we live today. That person's views, interests, and nature. One of the most obvious aspects of the second book is that Hitler dictated it right uh, a few weeks after an election in Germany in which his political party had done very poorly, not nearly as well as he had hoped. And he had to give some thought, well, why didn't we do better? And he almost certainly correctly figured out that one of the reasons they did poorly was that he had the Nazi party argued for a agreement an alliance with Mussolini's Italy. And Germans on the whole felt that Italy had deserted and stabbed them when it was allied to them in 1914. And the last thing many Germans wanted was an alliance with Italy, which in addition was persecuting a German minority <laughs> in the part of the former Austria that Italy had been awarded at the end of the First World War. So you had in the same newspapers accounts of Italian persecution of Germans in Italy 
and a political party that argued that this was the country we should be allied with. Now, what I find interesting and what anybody reading the second book would find interesting is that here is a politician who, when he learns that one aspect of his policies leads to losing votes, insists on sticking with it. Everybody else is wrong. It should be this way. <laughs> he explains at great length in this why the alliance with Italy is the right thing. It is an interesting insight into the person. And for Americans, there is furthermore the very strong emphasis on the need in the future to fight and crush the United States. Uh, at the time, 1928, Germany and the United States had very good relations. The Americans uh, had turned their backs on the European situation, had decided in 1920 to stop the earth and get off, and they were helping the Germans. But uh, from Hitler's perspective, that didn't make any difference. Uh, they needed to be conquered. And uh, as he indicated in the book, that one of the first responsibilities of a Nazi government would be to start preparations for war with the United States as soon as that was possible. And we know today that in 1937, when the war, military equipment for war with England and uh, France was well underway. He orders uh, the development of an intercontinental bomber or America bombers it's called, and a super battleship uh, to deal with the United States. It, it's important in my opinion uh, for people to realize uh, that this was a central figure who acted on his beliefs and uh, it is, I think, a little easier to understand actions and policies and procedures which seem at first weird if we understand the person in charge wanted those things done. That was what he intended and what we can see in both Mein Kampf and in the second book. Thank you. We're gonna to try to ask three more questions because we have some, you know, very interesting questions. And then uh, students in our class will reconvene after. So Gerhard, this question is asking, I'm gonna hold it up right here. Can you tell us the name and significance of your childhood pet mouse. Okay. When, when I came home one winter from visiting grandparents, uh, mother said, oh, you see something in your room. And I ran back in the apartment and there in the bedroom that my brother and I shared was a cage with a white mouse. The white mouse I called it Peep Schwanz. Peep was the noise it made, and Schwanz is the German word for tail. The mouse's tail was just as long as the hot mouse was long. And at a time when I had very, very few opportunities to play with other kids, I played with the mouse all the time. It was my favorite companion. And furthermore, as a result of this, you will understand, the mouse became very, very tame and would spend a great deal of time in my front shirt pocket with its paws on the rim looking out and it would just be with me. And the only thing I had to worry about uh, was the front of our apartment. My father, was fired from his government job 
He had been in the German army in the First World War, and when Jews in government jobs were fired in April of 1933, the then President Hindenburg insisted that those Jews who fought at the front should not be fired. When he died in August of 34, my father was fired and uh, converted our living room into his office to advise people on the rules for immigration and the front hall, entrance hall, became the waiting room. And so my parents insisted I could not go to the front uh, waiting room with the mouse in my pocket because that might frighten people. As a kid, I wondered why anybody would be frightened to have a little mouse look at them, but I did as my parents insisted. So the mouse was with me only in the back part uh, of our apartment. And uh, it uh, would also ride in our train. Uh, it loved to do that. It would be in a freight car with its paws on the rim, looking at the room as the uh, wind-up train went around. And what I thought was cute was that some 60 years later, when I was back in Hanover for an honorary degree, a student who had been in class with me in the first four grades came to the reception and so on and told me that the one thing he remembered about visiting was the mouse that rode in the train. But in any case, it died in late 1938, a few weeks before I left Germany. So it was buried in the backyard of our house in Hanover. Thank you. Okay, penultimate question is, I noted your omission of YIVO and its contributions to Holocaust historiography, especially Davidovitz, for example, or, or Isaiah Trunk's work. Are you concerned that historical research and scholarship driven by victim testimony might be too colored by hagiographical or other sources of distortion. The, uh, the reality is that I am both an admirer and a supporter uh, of YIVO. And uh, a number of the books that I cite are from there. Uh, I don't see any very, could not see any special reason, as I mentioned, I mentioned it in my talk, uh, that this is one of the centers of research today uh, that I referred to, and that does very important and sponsors very important research, and uh, uh, one of the key figures for many years in Nivo, now retired, in fact, asked me uh, to serve when she was professor uh, uh, at Tel Aviv University to serve on the doctoral committee of a student. And that led to that book by Yaron Pasha that I mentioned uh, in, in my talk. So the it was, I didn't mention the various institutions by name. Uh, there's one in London, there's one in, that I didn't mention. There are a couple in Israel that I meant, didn't mention. I mean, they're all over the place, but I just refer to them in general terms. Thank you. And this is our last question. Um, People like to state that times have changed and that the Holocaust or genocide will not be repeated again. However, this clearly isn't true as there are multiple ethnic killings in the world today. In your experience, why is there still a continuing hatred of people of specific communities? Do you think this will ever change? Are you optimistic about the future, knowing all you know and seeing all you have? Well, as I mentioned in my talk, the danger is there. 
nobody can persuade me that the Germans are some kind of different species of human being who went into this horrendous project. There were a few who opposed, but the overwhelming majority went along. The potential for evil doing is in human beings, as is the potential for doing good things, for being charitable, for being kind. And there is no guarantee, in my opinion, that people will always be on the good side of things. The danger of people doing bad things is always there. And one of, I would argue that one of the uh, important advantages of learning about, teaching about, talking about the Holocaust is to remind people to be careful that the possibilities of descent into horror are there at all times and require if they are not to be implemented, care, effort, watchfulness, and occasionally deliberate action.